Because we see them in action, we know a lot about how DJs work. Standing behind two turntables and a variety of accessories, they arrange tracks and add sounds, bringing together multiple elements to form a unique creation, which is orchestrated on the spot. Many DJs keep a backtrack going on one turntable while modifying the second one, creating layers of sound. Some modify both tracks, or three or four. They scratch, alter, sample, repeat, all the while the beat track spins in the background. Now, this might sound like a bit of a stretch at first, but try for a moment to think of someone working on a PC and putting together a PowerPoint presentation as working in the mode of the DJ. Here's what I mean. They get the PPT file going in PowerPoint or some other slideware application before moving over to a web browser to borrow an image. Then they're back to PowerPoint to paste it in and create some accompanying text, then off to Microsoft Word or another word processing program to read or edit the text of the presentation that will then need to be synced back up with the next slide in PowerPoint. Back behind the turntables, the DJ keeps a box of records at the ready, laying hands to vinyl to produce layers of sound that complement and work with and change that backtrack of the beat. Girl Talk and other DJs of the MP3 work on laptops, sometimes accompanied by an electric drum kit, which, if it's a Zen drum, is worn across the chest. And on the laptop, tracks are blended and combined and added electronically. The layering goes down live as the MP3 DJ stands or sits in front of the computer. Here in this video, you see Girl Talk mixing tracks at various live shows. There are some obvious differences between the DJ and the person putting together a PowerPoint presentation. While DJs do record their tracks, DJing is importantly a live, real-time kind of performance. Girl Talk, as you see, hunches over the laptop at center stage. The DJ making music foregrounds the improvisational interaction with turntables or computer, and it's really all about working live and working on the spot. The person putting together the PowerPoint presentation is really all about hiding the DJing that went on to create that PPT file. The PowerPoint DJ talks through a clean set of slides. The final product for the PowerPoint presenter is a sort of art of talking alongside or through a PPT file. And this in a sense hides or erases the DJing that went on beforehand. You see slide one, slide two, slide three, these are all clean tracks played before an audience. But a lot of what we make on our PC sample decks really involves DJing. Even some of the simplest word process documents take a DJ, able to work between multiple applications, conducting research over in a browser, say, and then mixing it back at the side of a, of a document. For those working with images, add in Photoshop or GIMP to the mix as one more application that the user goes in and out of to make a finished product. This is composition as mashup, composition as combination, and writer as MC. Composing robust content for the web takes no fewer than three applications. You have an image manipulation program, a text editor, and a browser, and you're constantly going between the three. Add in video, and you have another application. If you're creating web content, you're undeniably DJing it into existence. But with all that said, we seldom make the work of DJing between multiple applications a kind of show or performance in the way that the DJ does. The DJ spins at the turntables or in front of the PC, and people watch or dance all around. Desktop MCs work largely behind the scene, recording polished documents and PowerPoint files and HTML files. This presentation is about an emerging presentation mode that foregrounds instead of hides this notion of the PC as a mixing station, where the creator of a presentation is a desktop MC working in and between multiple applications. This emerging presentation mode takes on the self-conscious mixmaster approach, and evidence of it can be found in a number of places online. What I think is the best example, and the one I'll focus on here, comes from Scientific American. Via the video news hosting site Blip TV, Scientific American has released a series of masterfully DJ presentations created on a Macintosh and foregrounding the desktop as a site of convergence where desktop MCs orchestrate content from multiple applications. The examples from Scientific American are not composed single-handedly, but by a team. But before I move to an example of this work, I want to note that I'm not giving another PowerPoint is evil 
argument and presentation. As Lawrence Lessig and many other avid users of Slideware have shown, applications like PowerPoint can be used cleverly, artistically, thoughtfully, and very well. As you see here, these are all examples of masterfully created PowerPoint slides. I pulled them from the PPT sharing site slideshare.com to illustrate that from a design angle, PowerPoint can be done well. What these slides in and of themselves don't do, however, is illustrate the DJing that goes into making them, and the way that a good deal of electronic composition is patterned on DJ composition. So let's take a look at one of these desktop MC projects from Scientific American. Called the Science News Video Blog, these videos all run five minutes and cover recent innovations in science. This is journalism in the form of a webcast. Created, written, and directed by John Pavlis, hosted by John Pavlis and Christy Nicholson, both of whom you'll see. With production help from Andrew Cahill and Christopher Mims, this is no simple production. But as you'll also see, it has a very do-it-yourself style to it, concocted with a collection of different applications which are summoned into the otherwise hidden display space of the desktop and then captured via video screen recorder. You know, when I use online travel services like Orbitz here, I just increasingly can never get a straight direct flight. You always have to go through several hubs. Well, it turns out that our highly complex brain system works in much the same way. Researchers published this flight map of brain messages in PLOS Biology last week, which shows that most information gets rooted through several hubs that form one main structural core in the middle towards the back. Essentially, if all those nerve impulses were flights crisscrossing the country, that area would be like O'Hare or LaGuardia. The map also confirms that this main core is most active when our brains aren't actively engaged in anything. Weird, huh? Plus, it spans both sides of the brain, which underscores its connective function. Of course, we hope that it's better at serving those connections than an actual airport hub. 56% on time? God. Green transportation activism used to be easy. All you had to do was say, like this blog, get a carectomy, man, mass transit rules. Well, now the bar's been raised by someone who's saying that mass transit itself could use a green overhaul. Turns out that trains like the KMRT in Taiwan waste a lot of their energy breaking to a stop in stations to pick up their passengers. So Taiwanese inventor Peng Yu Lun just decided to design a train that never stops to pick up its passengers. As he showed in this press conference clip, Instead of getting on the train itself, people get on these boarding cars, which are then scooped up by the passing train without it actually having to stop. Same thing for getting off. You just get onto the right boarding car, which then detaches from the main train and coasts to a stop in the appropriate station. The main train still has to stop at the beginning and the end of the route, but removing all the stops in between is still way more efficient overall. The main problem to work out is how to get all those people onto the boarding cars. But as you can see from this clip, some transit companies already have a pretty can-do attitude about that kind of thing. So mysterious exploding meteoroids were all the rage last week with the 100th anniversary of the Tunguska event over Siberia. But if your taste in space blasts isn't so much related to kind of any kind of anniversary, you might be interested in the findings coming out of the University of Cincinnati. They're about a similar but less known event that may have wiped out all those lovable woolly mammoths about 13,000 years ago. Geophysicist Alan West thinks that right around the end of the last ice age, an asteroid exploded over what is now Canada. It would have fried large parts of North America and caused climate change effects that would have extended icy conditions for another 1,300 years, which syncs up nicely with the sudden disappearance of certain large mammals. People were kind of meh about this theory until the findings came out of the University of Cincinnati and they found, get this, you ready, diamonds in Ohio.